In this nugget, you and I get to talk about VFs, which we can use to create as a container to work with our virtual machines as a group. Let's begin. Imagine how a car operates. I mean, there's lots of parts that go into a car. For example, we have a, a motor, <laughs> or likely we have a motor. We have a transmission, there's an electrical system, and there's a lot of components that have to work together. And if any one of those is not present, it's really not gonna be a functioning car. Well, we also have that same type of a scenario with what are called multi-tiered applications. For example, maybe we have an application that requires a database server and a web server and an accounting server and if one of those servers, for example, the database server or the web server isn't running, the whole application is not going to function. In addition, if we're bringing up these servers for the first time, it's also very likely that there is an order that they have to be brought up in. For example, maybe the database server has to be up and initialized first before the web server runs or vice versa. And when we have applications like that, where there's multiple servers that are interrelated, we can put them all into a container that VMware calls a vApp. A vApp, think of it like a logical container where we can put our virtual machine for the database, our virtual machine for the web server, our virtual machine for the accounting server. And then inside of that vApp, we have additional controls. For example, we can guarantee resources for those virtual machines through the vApp. We can control the order when they're powered on, the order that they'll power on in. And we also have the ability to do exporting. If we want to export the entire vApp, which includes these three virtual machines, we can do those export functions, for example, exporting to an OVF or an OVA at the vApp level, which will include the details for each of the virtual machines as part of that vApp. From the vSphere web client to create a new vApp, this new container, what we would do is we'd click on the vCenter inventory lists icon right here. And then over on the left-hand side, we have an option for vApps. So we'll click on vApps. Now, currently, we don't have any of these vApp containers. So to create one, we'll click on the icon that allows us to create a new vApp. So we'll click on create a new vApp, and we have some options. We can create a new one, or we can clone an existing vApp. Now, since we don't have an existing vApp, we'll go ahead and select create a new vApp, and click on next. It's next asking us, where do you want to place this vApp? So we'll put it in the Las Vegas data center and we'll put it inside of cluster one and we'll click on next. Next, it's asking us if we want to place it in one of these folders and let's go ahead and put it in the Linux folder. If we had a special folder just for vApps, we could put it in that folder as well for organizational purposes. So for now, we'll put it in the Linux folder and we'll click on next. Now it's asking us about resource allocation for this vApp and the VMs that will be contained in this vApp. And we'll have a separate nugget on resource allocation, which we can also apply to vApps. So we're gonna accept the defaults here. We'll click on next. We have a summary and we'll click on finish. So now we have this logical container, this vApp, where we can add virtual machines to it. So let's hover over the drop down list and let's go down to hosts and clusters to select host and clusters. Let's expand cluster one. And there we have our VApp. If we click on the down arrow to expand it, there's nothing to show because there's no virtual machines inside of that VApp container yet. So if we want to add some virtual machines to this VApp container, we can right click. And from the drop down, we can hover over new virtual machine. And from the subsequent drop down, we can click on new virtual machine. And this gives us tons of options of bringing in virtual machines as part of this VApp. So we could create a brand new virtual machine, deploy from a template. We could clone an existing virtual machine and the list goes on. In fact, what I'd like to do is let's clone an existing virtual machine and add that as part of the vApp. So with the option of clone an existing virtual machine selected and highlighted, we'll click on next. Here it's asking us to point out the virtual machine that we want to clone. So let's go ahead and in the USA folder, in the Las Vegas data center, in the Linux folder, I've got a machine called Linux-VM which we created in an earlier nugget. We're gonna use that for this demonstration. So with Linux-VM selected, we'll go ahead and click on Next. Now it's asking us for a name. What do you wanna call this clone that you're gonna create? And let's call it Linux-VApp-01, <laughs> which implies that we're gonna be creating a few of these virtual machines as part of this vApp, and we'll click on Next. Now, by default, it's already highlighting the vApp container object because that's how we started this wizard. So with this vApp, named vApp, still selected, we'll go ahead and click on Next. Regarding the data store, I'm gonna go ahead and use the iSCSI data store, and we're gonna tell it to use thin provisioning for this virtual machine that's gonna be part of this vApp, and we'll click on Next. It gives us a summary, and then we'll click on Finish, 
And in the background, it's creating a brand new virtual machine as part of this vApp. And there it is. There's Linux vApp01. And there's more than one way to skin a cat. We could, for example, if you love cats, that's okay. I'm sorry about that. If we wanted to clone this virtual machine, which is already associated with that vApp, that would be yet another way to go ahead and create another virtual machine as part of the vApp. So let's use that option. So we'll right click on this virtual machine that's already included as part of the vApp. We'll right click. From the drop down, we'll select clone. And from the further drop down, we'll select clone to virtual machine. It's asking for a name of this virtual machine. Let's go ahead and call it Linux dash vapp dash zero two. We'll click on next. We'll expand the cluster. We'll select the vapp because that's where we want to be. We'll click on next. We'll select the iSCSI data store. We'll select thin provisioning. We'll click on next. And then we'll click on next and finally finish. And now what it's doing in the background is creating another virtual machine that's also associated with that vapp container. And there it is, Linux vApp02. And let's do it one more time for a third virtual machine. And now we have these three virtual machines that are all part of this vApp. We have 0, 01, 0, 02, and 0, 03. So if we want to take a look at the vApp itself, we could click on the vApp and then under Related Objects. And with the Virtual Machines sub-tab selected, it's showing us each of the three virtual machines that are associated and included as part of that vApp. Now regarding the starting order, if we wanted to control, for example, the details of how those virtual machines are booted up or powered up as part of the vApp, we could right click on the vApp. And from the drop down, we could select Edit Settings, which would be editing the settings for the vApp object. And then from here, we have lots of options, including the starting order. So regarding the starting order, if we click on the arrow to expand that section, by default, it's showing three startup groups, group one, two, and three, one for each of the virtual machines. If we wanted to reverse that, for example, we could take the third virtual machine and hit the up arrow key and put that at the very top. And we take the Linux machine number two and put that in group two, and then that would leave the Linux vApp one in group three. Or if we just wanted to have two groups, we could click on the Linux vApp zero one, and with it selected, we could use the up arrow and put it into group two. So that way we can control the start order. I'm gonna put this back so that VM number one starts first, VM number two starts second, and VM number three starts third. So not only can we control the startup sequence, we can also control the delay. So for example, if we wanted each of these to come up, like for example, 15 seconds of each other, we can simply highlight them, put in 15, press enter, and then go down to the second virtual machine, type in 15 to indicate 15 seconds should elapse, and then go to the third virtual machine and put in 15 there as well. And this is, <laughs> this is a little funky, so I, typed in 15. It didn't look like it took it completely. I'm going to go back to virtual machine number two. I'm going to type in 15 and press enter, and that should make it stick. So I just want to make sure I have 15 for each of them. And if we had VMware tools installed on these virtual machines, now on these tiny little Linux images, I do not have VMware tools. But if we did, we could also indicate that we should start up the next virtual machine, for example, based on the VMware tools being ready on the previous virtual machine. So I'm putting a 15 second delay on each one of those and we'll click on OK. Now to start up this vApp, all we do is right click on the vApp and then from the power menu, select power on, that'll power them up. Now before we power up these three virtual machines, which should power up approximately 15 seconds apart from each other in the order we specified, what we could also do is we could back this up. We could export the entire vApp, including the three virtual machines that are part of that vApp and we could use OVF or OVA formatting for that. So before I power them on, let me go ahead and export them by right clicking on the vApp. From the drop down menu, we'll go to OVF template and then we'll select from the sub menu, export OVF template. I'm gonna go ahead and name this vApp. I'm gonna specify that I wanna export them as a .ova and I'll choose the folder to put them in. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put those as part of the Nugget Lab file, so that's where they'll land. And if we're trying to write to the same file and we just want to go ahead and overwrite the existing files, we can simply use the checkbox for overwrite existing files and we'll click on OK. So that is now in the process of doing an export of that vApp, which includes the three virtual machines. 
And if we look at our recent tasks, wah, 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 <laughs> could not connect to the remote resource, couldn't resolve host name. Oh, bummer. If that happens to you in your lab environment, the first thing that I would recommend checking is make sure that DNS resolution is working from the PC that you're sitting at to the devices in your vSphere environment. So I think I have DNS already set up and working. I am simply going to try that one more time. I'm going to right click on the V app. From the OVF template menu, I'm going to select Export OVF Template. I'm going to click on Choose to browse where I want to put them. Overwrite existing files if they're present. And I want to use an OVA. And with that in place, let me go ahead and click on OK. And it still cannot connect to the remote resource. Gosh, golly, look at that. So let me check my DNS real quick. So under Control Panel, Change Adapter Settings, here's my network adapter that I'm primarily using. I'm going to go to Properties of that network adapter. Go down to IPv4. I can double click on that to look at the properties. And sure enough, my preferred DNS server is 192.168.1.111, which is the Windows DNS server that has my vSphere all in it. And then the alternate is a Google web server on the internet. So I'll click on OK, because that looks good. We could also go to a command prompt and use NSLOOKUP or try to ping by name to verify that works. But I think those are all in place. So let me try this one more time. I'll right click. OVF template, export OVF template, and let me give it a new name to this. Maybe it's having a problem because I already do have a vapp.ova there because I tested it before the nugget. So let's call this new. I'll choose the folder. I'll use that same folder. We'll specify OVA, and then we'll click on OK. And we'll see if we have any better success. And there it goes. Ah, oh, dang. Okay, so it wasn't a DNS issue, but it appears it was some type of a conflict when trying to overwrite the file with the same name. So what I'll do is I'll include both of those OVAs. I've got the vapp.ova and vapp-new.ova, and I'll include both of those for you in the Nugget Lab files. So our next step is to power these guys up. So we'll right click on vapp, we'll go to power, and then select power on. And what we should see is that these virtual machines should power up within 15 seconds of each other, because that's what we configured for the vapp. So we'll give that a moment to bring up all three virtual machines. And then once it does, we can go to recent tasks and take a look at the timestamps. So the timestamps for starting each of the virtual machines should be about 15 seconds off of each other. So now that they're all up and running, let's go down to recent tasks. And here in recent tasks, we have power on of the virtual machines for 0, 01, 0, 02, and 0, 03. And if we look at the timestamps over here, they are indeed about 15 seconds roughly between each other. The other thing we can do is we can power off these as a group. Now, if we had VMware tools, it'd be nice and clean because we could do a graceful shutdown of all the virtual machines in this vApp. But as a result of not having VMware tools, if we select the vApp, we go to power, and we select power off, even though we have the option of shutdown, <laughs> there's no VMware tools to gracefully do it. But uh, we could do shutdown or power off effectively. It is going to power off each of the virtual machines in the vApp. So we'll click on yes to confirm. And now those three virtual machines are shut down. One of the other cool things is if we wanted to delete a vApp, we could right click on it, which by the way is very similar to deleting virtual machines. From the menu, we'd go down to delete from disk. We would select delete from disk. And it's saying, hey, this is a little warning. You delete this vApp, you're also going to be deleting permanently each of the VMs. So we'll click on yes, go ahead, and it will delete the vApp and the three respective virtual machines as part of that vApp. And they are gone. However, if we changed our mind and we want to bring the vApp back, we already exported it, so we could just as easily import it. We could right click on the cluster, we could select deploy OVF template, we could click on local file, browse for it. Here's our vapp folder. Here's the vapp-new.ova that we just exported a few minutes ago. With that selected, we can click on Open, and then click on Next. It gives us a chance to review the details. We'll click on Next. We can specify where we're going to put it. Let's put it in the Las Vegas Data Center in the Linux folder. We'll click on Next. We'll specify iSCSI, and we'll specify Thin Provisioned. Click on Next. It's asking us what network do we want to put them on. You know what? Let's put them on a distributed switch port group. We have DSVMNet4. Let's put them there. That'll put them on the 10.44 subnet. And each of those virtual machines, by the way, are configured to use DHCP. So they should be fine. We'll click on Next. Here's a summary. And we can also say that we want to power it on after deployment and click on Finish. So now it's going to deploy that vApp with its respective three virtual machines, which should be powered on at 15 second intervals. 
and when they're all up and running, they should all be on the 10.44 subnet. So if we go to recent tasks, so it's deployed the OVF template, that's great. It started the vApp, it looks like it's powering on the first virtual machine, and then in 15 more seconds it should power on the second one, and then another 15 seconds it should power on the third. And if we do a refresh of our host and clusters view right here off the main page, there's our vApp, and it shows that it has the three virtual machines that are now up and running. So if we wanted to test one of those, let's go to virtual machine number one, we'll select it, we'll go ahead and click on the launch remote console, We'll log in as the user of VMware and the password is Nugget, exclamation mark 23 with a capital N, press enter. And let's go to a shell. We'll do ifconfig to verify our IP address. 10.44.51, that's the beginning of the DHCP pool that our good friend, our Frisco router is handing out on that subnet. And if we do a ping out to 8.8.8.8, that also verifies that we have connectivity all the way out to the internet and back. In this nugget, we've discussed and demonstrated how we can create a container object called a vApp to work with our virtual machines as a group. Thank you for joining me for this nugget. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.